If you are sitting at home next to your radio, you're hearing the music faster than you are if you're in the hall. Listening for the secret, searching for the sound. This is the Sound Podcast with Ira Haberman. This band's name in and of itself should evoke fun and frivolity, but giving Organ Freeman a listen will no doubt get you up and dancing. I know it did for me. This three-piece organ-based trio brings a frenzied soul and funk attack that I'm sure you'll appreciate. Don't take my word for it. Have a listen to the first track off their sophomore release, Respect My Art. Here is Long Live the King featuring Dave Branwine of Turquoise.
We recently had the chance to sit down with Trevor Steer, the chief protagonist, given that he's the keys and organ player in Oregon Freeman, to get his take on the project. We started by asking him how their sophomore release's sound was so different from their first record. I think the first record, um, as you might imagine, just going into like starting out writing with a new organ trio, um, you end up drawing a lot on things that have been done in that configuration before because it's, you know, there have been a lot of people that came before us who did it very, very well. Um, so it, it kind of, I feel like that first record lived in that soul jazz kind of genre, you know, like it, it was a little bit more us than that, but it was still very much in the same foundation. And then the second one, as we you know, just wrote more together and pre- played more together and figured out what it is we were trying to achieve, is a lot more expansive than that and just incorporate some different elements that you wouldn't normally find in an organ trio. When, when you talk about organ trios, who are some of those organ trios that inspired you to make music? The first one that comes to my mind, at least, is Modescu, Martin, and Wood, but the sound is so different from that. Are there other organ trios that I that I should be aware of that inspired you guys to make the music you make? Well, I would say that the, the biggest influence for me was definitely Soul Life. Um, I didn't find out about Modesky until much later, but Soul Live I found, I think I was 10 or 11 years old, and I was poking around on mp3.com, which was the first website that you could order. Like, if you were an independent band, they would make your CDs for you and ship them and sell them individually. So, I, you know, I was wasting time on the internet and found their first record, and it just blew my little 10-year-old mind. <laughs> I ordered the CD, and it was like it was like a blank mirror CD with black Helvetica type on it, you know? It was the most ghetto approximation of <laughs> of the disc. And, uh, yeah, I just... They were one of my favorite groups ever since. Um, so even though I didn't come around and play organ until much later, uh, I just had that sound in my head from the very beginning. Was piano your first instrument, or was it organ? Piano was my first instrument, yeah. I didn't actually... I didn't get an organ until maybe five years ago, like a real one. So, Soul Live, and then as you progress and listen to more organ music, I would imagine that uh, Modesky and... Yeah, Mar- Modesky Martin, Yeah, uh, definitely Modesky Martin would, but, you know, there's just the the jazz foundation of that as well, like Jimmy Smith, Jimmy Griff. Um, there's so many great jazz players. You know, now, obviously, Joey DeFrancesco does a lot of, of that stuff as well in more of the jazz idiom. What made you switch from playing piano to to getting your chops on, on an organ? I don't really think it made me do it. I, you know, I, I actually, so I played piano when I was younger and then was playing saxophone pretty exclusively from my mid-teens until my early 20s and didn't come back around until keyboards later. So I didn't really have a direct path to anything, but I I think because I grew up listening to Soul Alive specifically so much, um, it was always in the back of my mind as something that would be cool to do, and just I never got around to doing it. So that was one of the, the foundations for this group, was just having the opportunity to screw around with doing the left-hand bass thing and doing a, you know, sort of tapping into those early influences for me. And it's strictly organ at this point. It's not any other kind of electric keyboard. I mean, the record itself is full of organ, obviously. But, you know, my my favorite red, uh, instrument is the Fender Rhodes. Do you guys ever fool around with other kind of sounds? Or do you mostly stick to, because of the left-handed bass thing, mostly stick to uh, organ as, as your main instrument? Oh, I mean, there's there's all kinds of stuff on there. Um, I'd say I play the least piano out of any of the keyboard instruments. I, I, we don't really use any piano in our project, but I mean, there's roads on both of the records. There's a whole bunch of synths on this record. 
There's um, Clavinet on both the records. But yeah, I, I, we're definitely, it's definitely not a limitation to try to confine things to the organ. But it's more of a challenge of how do we take the organ trio sound and expand upon it, or conversely, how do we take another idea that might not sound like an organ trio idea and make it an organ trio idea? Right. Got it. But the bass really is that kind of that, that three piece. And then on top of that, you're adding other sounds, right? Yeah. So what, what inspired the rest of the guys? I mean, you know, you, you obviously had this thing about the soul live record, but, or, or that first soul live record Were were there things that, you know, the other guys in the group latched onto how did you convince Rob and Eric that you know this was the thing to do and and this was kind of the approach you guys wanted to take with this band I didn't <laughs> it's pretty simple <laughs> I, I didn't convince anyone of anything I mean we were all just in school together and trying stuff out so you know you might have guessed from our band name that we don't take ourselves uh, too seriously <laughs> right so, uh, you know, we're not, we're not like a lot of bands that are out there in, in this particular scene, I think in the, in the um, genre that you live, where we're just doing our band. You know, all of us have been freelance musicians in our life for a long time, and I don't think we really considered the possibility that this would be our main pursuit uh certainly not when we started and certainly not you know even past us putting out our first record i think it was it was a fun thing for us to do and we all really enjoyed it and we wanted to keep doing it but it never really crossed our minds that this is a thing that we would be pushing so hard and yeah so we didn't really have any of those conversations you know it wasn't like we sat around trying to come up with a sound together. It just kind of happened organically as we played together because, you know, we've also played together in other capacities just for work for other artists. So, you know, because we're so familiar with each other and each other's playing, just kind of progressed on its own. So is this now now a full-time project for you guys? I mean, is the plan you have a bunch of tour no. dates? No, it's still not, right? <laughs> nope. Well, you know, it just depends on how you define a full-time project. You know, like there's guys we go on a tour with Turquoise and they're playing who knows how many shows a year, 150, 200, at some points in their career at least 200, which is a lot of shows. Um, and then, you know, there's bands like, uh, like Wolfpack who they play almost no shows. So, like, is, is, you know, do you define Wolfpack as a full-time band? Like, I don't think I do, but, you know, I don't think that's the public perception of it. I think everyone thinks, you know, that's as much of a band as any of the other bands. So, I think we're just naturally, we're not out there to play 200 shows a year. We're out there to do things that are special and fun. So... Uh, let's talk a bit about the record because it is special and fun. And as I mentioned off the top uh, before we actually started the interview, I I listened to uh, Respect My Art last night and I couldn't stop dancing around uh, from the very beginning. I mean, it is – well, first of all, you have a ton of guests on on the show that kind of fill up the sound. Not to say that you know the three-piece on its own can't fill up that sound, but you have – you know, um, uh, Theo Katzman joins in, David Branwine from from Turquoise, and and you know all these other players. Was was it arranging before you invited these people in, or did you arrange kind of on the fly with all of these guests in the room? Uh, I think most of the stuff we arranged beforehand. Um, I mean, each of those collaborations kind of comes about individually. Like, obviously, for the horn players, we do a lot of that arranging in advance, um, if not all of it, before the session. Um, you know, getting Theo and Sean on that one track uh, was different because that's very... I mean, that song was definitely written 
I, I, I wrote that song after going to one of Theo's solo shows. Like I came home and wrote it. So it was very much like in his style to begin with. So it, you know, it was in a way based on what he might do in that situation. Um, yeah, you know, and, and then some of these things just kind of sprang up. Like Dave, uh, we ended up getting on that track because when we were touring with them, the, we we would just have them come up and guest on it live, and we just loved what he was doing. So almost everything was already recorded on it, and we're just like, Dave, we got, we got to incorporate some sort of element of what's been happening on the road because it's awesome. Um, and he was just approaching it from a way that we wouldn't have thought of. So I uh, just sent him everything that was already done and said, do whatever you want. And we, and we kind of adjusted from there. So uh, let's, for those who don't know the record, Theo and Sean show up on what, what song? On uh, Change for a Nickel. Right. And the, Dave shows up track. on, Dave shows on up. On the first track. Right. Long Live the King. Is that something that you guys do? I mean, these are songs that you live with on the road or when you uh, get Oregon Freeman together. And then is the idea to eventually uh, cut these tracks again in the studio? Or did you have it cut and you were just playing around with it until you actually decided to put put a whole bunch of tracks together? I mean, how does the whole songwriting um, and album come kind of together? Well, I'd say it it happens over a very long period of time. Um, we don't we don't write a song, get together, rehearse it, and then go re- record it. Like usually, the way that it's gone is we'll write something, we'll get it to a point that we feel good enough to play it, um, and then we'll start playing it live. And as we play it live over the course of multiple shows we'll figure out what about it we liked and what about it we didn't like, and then it'll evolve slowly from there. And then even the recording process, I mean, we started this record in January. So it's, you know, given that we're all freelancing for other people for our, for our main jobs, like for most of our time, it makes it a a little bit more difficult to schedule and get us all in one place at the same time. So started in January, we went on art. We did a couple of weeks, of touring in February. He did almost all of March and April, got back together for a few months. People did separate tours for work, so we couldn't do anything for a while after that. And so it kind of goes in phases. And I think the benefit of that is it gives you a lot of time to reflect on the things that you've done and what's working and what's not working. Uh, for those who don't know, what, what bands, you know, what, how are you earning your income? What bands are you playing with and, and on the road with? I'm not a name dropper. You're not a name. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll we'll look them up. And that's that's less, that's its own thing. <laughs> we'll we'll uh we'll look it up and and let people know uh, afterwards. I'm curious about uh the voices on Green Grapes, uh, Green Green Grapes. Is that is that you guys fooling around, or did you lift it from somewhere? The um so it's yeah there's I mean obviously there's us plus a number of people just friends of ours yelling <laughs> the uh, the main catchphrase uh, and then the breakdowns are actually Ryan who is um, Ryan Delmore who did our album art for both of the records and uh, yeah I don't know we just let him do whatever he wants it sounds like <laughs> he gets our sense of humor. It sounds like, yeah, I mean, that comes across certainly from the album art and from the name of the band. I mean, I kept mentioning the name of the band to people and they were like, uh, I can't find Morgan Freeman. I can't find Organ Friedman. I can't, you know, uh, it's it. it <laughs> How did you come up with the name in the first place? Uh, Eric did. And uh, it pains me every day that I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, why? Yeah. Full, full credit to Eric. I don't. I don't really know that I, there's a process I can describe. Right, you were just goofing think, around. Uh, there's a storied tradition of organ organ bands with organ puns in their names, and we just found the best one. So, um, <laughs> that's it. And so the record's out, and and I mean it's it's receiving some great praise uh, from from different websites. Is that exciting for you guys? Do you ever think, okay, we are going to 
you know, we do want to do this full time in some capacity or in, in a uh, more prolonged way in some capacity. Is that does that ever come to your mind or is it just, you know, this is a nice side project kind of thing where the three of us can get together and no. have some some of our friends it's it's i mean i wouldn't describe it as a side project at this point like i think there, there, it's not like we're making a conscious decision to just not do it you know it, it, it's definitely like we're definitely committed and we're definitely all doing it it's just more of a matter of um focus you know like you can make your focus to get out and play as many shows as possible or you can make your focus to you know focus on making great studio records and then be a little more selective with the things that you do live or, you know, just for your own, like not like, I, I don't, it's probably harder to conceptualize for listeners, but being on the road for that many days a year is just really, really hard on human beings. So it's just not for everyone. And uh, I think that might be the case for some, if not all of us. So it, it just depends. But yeah, I mean, we're definitely excited that people are enjoying the record, you know, and we're we're grateful for all of the press that we've gotten so far. But you know, press is not an end. Like it makes it definitely makes me happy that people are enjoying it, and that you know, people who review things for a living are enjoying it. But that's it's not really like a focus for us. It's it, it, we're not like craving the validation. <laughs> You know what I mean? So the the validation is not something that you crave, necessarily making money from uh, an ongoing kind of uh, tour of this record. Is it is it about is it about the art and about, you know, at this point, having funds with with your friends in this is the studio. And, and, and is that kind of what excites you guys the most about this project? Yeah, I think, you know, when we end up doing a whole variety of things for work, but without question, this is the most challenging thing that any of us get to do. Um, and we don't do it just because it's hard. Um, it's just a rare thing nowadays. I think a lot of people, particularly in LA, particularly freelance guys, like, like having a original project, it kind of falls by the wayside it's just really easy to gloss over a lot of times the reason that you might have started playing music in the first place because it's not necessarily relevant to your day-to-day -day life. Um, so this is kind of like a yeah, I mean, that's the, Yeah, the, the main thing that... I, the main reason we do it is for the enjoyment, and I think that ideally should be the case for everyone. But, um, yeah, I mean, I, I would love to at the point where I could just do this, but, you know, without it dominating my life. Right, right. I got it. I got it. Uh, what's the plan now? The plan is to do some shows in September and October um, and continue doing the other things that you do, obviously. And, and are you planning to go back into the studio anytime soon? Is it something that you're always thinking about? Are you always writing or creating, at least by yourself, so that you have material to go back in the studio with uh, Eric and Rob and, and sort of lay down some tracks? Are there tracks that we haven't even heard that, you know, might see the light of day one day? Currently, there's nothing that you haven't heard. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I mean, we're always, we're always writing and, and listening for new ideas, but there's no real rhyme or reason to it. I would say sometimes, you know, there's some of the ideas that are on this record that were written years ago, maybe like even very, very close to the time of the release of our first record that were just like so brand new that they weren't recordable or we just already had enough tracks on that record, and, you know, any number of reasons um, that just stuck around and made it onto this one. And then I would say like three or four of the songs got written in like the month or two leading up to the us uh, starting to record so i'm not at least i am not consistent in my in my writing speed so you know i i think it's it's definitely on our minds that we definitely don't want to wait another two years to put something out um i've been toying around with the idea of just doing a shorter release like a like a four-ish song uh ep 
it's it's hard to say. I can't. I definitely can't give anyone definitive plans for. It's very organic. I mean, the whole the whole process is very organic, and 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 probably the way you guys came together seems to be very organic. So, I mean, if it's working for you, why not why not stick with it? Yeah, exactly. And uh, I think you know well, one of the things that's really important to us is to not put a whole ton of pressure on ourselves. Like uh, we realized a while ago that like the more importance you place on I guess anything about being a band, but particularly writing and performing, like the the more meaning you assign to it, the more difficult it becomes. So if you go into playing a big show thinking, Oh my God, this is a big show. This is the one that's going to make my career. Then you're, you're destined to just mess everything up because that's just how brains work. <laughs> Fair enough. But you know, the times that we've gone out and played and, you know, things have gone horribly wrong or like the sound's not working or, you know, the organ that they backlined me barely makes sound at all and I can't hear myself. Those seem to be the times we play best because you just stop caring so much. Right, right. Yep. Uh, what is your favorite kind of organ to play? Is it is a, is it, uh, is it a Hammond or, or is there something specific? That yeah, you- it's the Hammond that works. <laughs> or a Leslie with a Hammond that works, right? It's kind of amazing that I have to specify that, but yeah, <laughs> you know, I mean, for a while we would fly and I would play backline organs at festivals and I just had so many bad experiences that I actually like half the time I play with a digital one anyway. Right. It's probably just, we're not, we're, you know, we're not touring with a trailer. We're not driving across the country when we're doing this few dates, we're flying directly to places. So at, at this point, I've gotten to a place where I just value consistency. <laughs> it's much more important for me to to know what's going to happen when I press keys down. Right. If you strap one of those things to your back and 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 a Leslie, I mean, it's you know, then you'll you'll always be consistent with your sound. But I guess that's not the most practical thing you can do is to lug around uh, that instrument specifically. No, it is not. But. Uh, yeah, my mine over here is an A one hundred two, which is the same the same thing as a B three, really, just in a different cabinet. But uh, yeah, and yeah, my favorite organ is my organ, but only get to play that in California, unfortunately. Right. Well, uh, thanks for taking the time. Really enjoy the record. Seriously, really, really. Uh, I'm not I'm not lying when I was saying I was dancing around last night, and uh, and thanks for <laughs> it. And and I we you know. We'll, we'll keep an eye on you guys and, and see if, you know, we can hook up again down the road because uh, we'd love to hear more stories about um, the record and your uh, tour date escapades and all of that. You have a couple of tour dates in California, one in Nevada coming up, and uh, we'll be keeping an eye on things and letting people know where they can where they can check you out and uh, check out the music you're making. So thanks for taking the time. Uh, really appreciate it, Trevor. Thanks for having me. Great stuff, but let's get back to the music. Here is The Green Green Grapes, another fun track from Respect My Art. To learn more about Oregon Freeman, you can visit OregonFreemanMusic.com.
Frank the Brat? Those were humans. Uh, Gilbert Grape? That was Johnny Depp. Terminator 3? You think there were grapes in that movie? Grapes are totally underrepresented in Hollywood. I'll tell you what. I'm not gonna stand for it. I'm not gonna stand for it. You've been listening to The Sound Podcast. Technical production by Adam Karsh and Andrea Ruse. Inspired by the Grateful Dead and you, their fans. Like us on Facebook. Subscribe on your favorite podcast platform. And find us at thesoundpodcast.com. 